President and CEO of Project Assistance. Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 to transform our clients' approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence and execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Gus is a portfolio and project management expert. He's a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, including contributions to several editions of Macmillan's popular Q book series, special edition using Microsoft Project. He's also the author of the project management content in the third edition of Expediting Drug and Biologics Development and has been a presenter at several, several national meetings of the Drug Information Association. Gus? Thank you, Janet. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for attending today's webinar session. Uh, we uh, have gotten a very strong positive response to this topic and we look forward to covering this information. I'd like to start off uh, just briefly by going through today's agenda. And the first topic we're going to talk about is just to define the, the challenge. We, we, we talked about this keystone of resource management uh, and we want to talk about what, the, what are the challenges really in the context of portfolio and project management. What is this challenge that we're talking about? and uh, to show uh, some of the major points of what that challenge is. Uh, the solution, we'll talk about uh, how we uh, get beyond the Gantt chart and get to the rigorous level of project management that's required to bring these two uh, major areas together. And then also some best practices to transform the organization to actually begin to embrace this keystone. Uh, we'll talk about how we drive executive buy-in, certainly a large challenge in these kinds of initiatives, especially in today's economic environment. Avoiding failure, uh, some recommended best practices, and then some next steps. And finally, as Jen mentioned, we'll, uh, we'll close out with about a five to ten minute question and answer session. So the first thing we want to talk about is really what, what is this resource management challenge and how do, we, how do we address this challenge as we go forward? And just to put this whole concept uh, in, in uh, context, uh, we're really talking about, from a portfolio management standpoint, the subject of the strategy and governance of an organization that really says, how do we propose projects? How do we select them? How do we measure and respond uh, to the results of those projects? So really, we have this governance process that's defined at the portfolio management level. And then really, at the execution level, we have two major areas. That really, uh, that, that really speaks to how we deliver on time, on budget, and on spec. So for, so for today's conversation, we're going to be focusing on the linkage between the top part of the portfolio management governance uh, and strategy layer, and at the execution layer, we're really going to talk about the project and program management and the linkage between those two domains. Again, to put, to put in detail context, the overall process map that we're talking about, just to create a common language for our presentation today. When we speak about portfolio management processes, or more, or more accurately, project portfolio management, we're not necessarily talking about investment portfolios like we might have with our 401k or our Merrill Lynch portfolio. We're really talking about a project portfolio, which really starts with how do we collect and manage the requests for new initiatives to start within the organization. So a major process area around the central collection and management of project requests. From there, we, we move into a business case management scenario. In other words, once we have an idea or a request, how do we begin to build a common set of business cases with a common set of information around those business cases? So as we move into the third box, initiative review, rating, and evaluation, the business case gives us that common language by which we can do what we would maybe refer to as an apples and apples comparison. How do we have the right metrics from a business case to begin to review to rate those ideas, to evaluate those ideas, such that we can then move into the box we see at the 6 o'clock position on your slide, the selection and approval process. So now we have the, the ability to review and rate and evaluate which one then are the right projects for the portfolio, or the right ideas to actually become projects within the portfolio. Um, as we move to this next box, this measure and respond, we'll spend uh, a little bit of extra time talking about this particular box today from a uh, from the standpoint of the overall challenge that we're addressing in today's webinar, the idea that once a project starts, how do we measure what's happening within those projects? And then at the portfolio level, what's the response to what we're finding, about, finding out about how those projects are going? And then ultimately, the final point or the rearview mirror point is to say, how do we ensure that 
if we go back up to that first idea that was collected that said there's a business case that this is a good idea because it's going to save money or it's going to make things better in our products or it's going to increase speed to market or it's going to reduce costs, whatever those ideas are, to analyze those portfolio benefits to ensure that we're getting the anticipated benefits. As we move down into the execution layer, uh, the project management processes I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but again, just to create a common language for today's presentation, the idea of defining the scope of a project to plan and organize that project. Uh, so, so we have those uh, sort of pre-initiation steps of a project. As we then go into project execution and look at how we track status and analyze any variances from the initial plan, how we manage the scope issues and risks as, as, as changes occur within the project, what we're going to do about those new items of scope, those new issues that arise, those risks that realize themselves that we were hoping weren't going to happen, uh, so that we can move on to a revision of the plan to adjust to those changes as they occur. And really, at the end of the day, we're talking about a process here when we're communicating status. We're really talking about a process of how we manage change. Right? As the initial scope and the initial plan are, are, are typically not exactly what happens as the project unfolds. So we track and we analyze those variances. We deal with the issue of scope and risk. We revise the plan. We communicate status. And ultimately, the closeout and project improvement, which feeds back into the portfolio. So the challenge uh, that we want to talk to today is really these two major circles. If we look at uh, the portfolio managers, the, the challenge that the portfolio managers typically face are is how do we get confidence in the accuracy and reliability of the current portfolio commitments? If we're going to commit, let's use, uh, for argument's sake, uh, a January 1st fiscal year in which senior management wants to know what are we going to commit to this year? You know, we, we, we have 50 projects we've requested. Are we going to do all 50? Are we going to do 35? Are we going to do 10? And if we say we're going to do 35, where is that confidence and the accuracy and the reliability of the commitments to say if we're going to deliver half of them in the first half of the year and the other half in the second half of the year, that we, in fact, are going to get all 35 and we're going to get them as expected? And uh, clearly driving that is, if I'm going to commit to new projects, I have to know what the availability of resource capacity will be to meet those proposed commitments. So I, I'd like to use the analogy of, of, uh, of, of an air traffic control system. You know, if somebody were to ask me as, uh, as, as the main scheduler of Southwest Airlines, how many new flights can we put out tomorrow, my first question would be, how many aircraft will be available? And if he's told me, well, all the aircraft will be available, I'm going to say, well, there aren't any down for maintenance. Aren't there some that are not going to have completed their flights by tomorrow? Maybe they're on their way to Europe. So I really need to know sort of the in-flight status before I know what the available capacity is. And projects are very much the same way. Before I can commit to new projects, I have to know whether the projects I'm currently executing are going to finish. So the project managers are, their challenge is to provide accurate resource demand data for the active projects. So do we have enough people to get the projects done? and really to be engaged in the forecasting the resource demand for future projects. If I say, I think I'm going to need six people for six months, and I haven't consulted a project manager who can sit down and scope it and plan it, I may not have accurate information. So we see these bi-directional green arrows here that, where we see this, this uh, sort of vicious circle that says the portfolio managers need information to the, uh, about the projects, and the project managers need information about the portfolio, and really the two are inextricably linked, and that's really the challenge we want to speak to today. And, and, and the, you know, the other thing, the other challenge we have with us is, you know, when we get that nice little stack of that house of cards, that portfolio, that really is based on, you know, this a theoretical environment where the project managers have all done and the program managers have all done a stupendous job of forecasting the current resource demands and the future resource demands for new projects, when we, when we add up those cards and we get them all stacked up, the problem we have is, is, is that change is constantly happening. Right? So every time we get that house of cards set up, a strong breeze blows in through the window, and we end up with the result on the right, right where we have to go back and restack the cards. So not only do we have this initial challenge that says the portfolio managers need accurate and reliable uh, por uh, portfolio commitments and need to know availability, it's not a snapshot in time. It's not I set the cards up once 
and everything's nice and hunky-dory and it stays that way, but this continual churn that happens, and we'll get into the churn as we go through this, uh, the, 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 the more detailed linkages that occur between these port, uh, this portfolio and this, and this uh, project that consists of the portfolio. So again, the keystone, when we see the need to link project and portfolio management, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to link project and portfolio management. But, but really the, the, the theory for today or the hypothesis for today that we posit for today's webinar is to say the real driver or the real keystone is this thing called resource management. We can say until uh, we're blown in the face, portfolio management and project management need to be linked. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to investigate why it is that we see resource management continually creating that challenge. So, so as we've dealt with our customers, on, on a daily and weekly and monthly and yearly basis, we see over and over and over again this question of how can I get my portfolio to be reliable unless I can get accurate resource management information from the projects. So we call that the keystone because ultimately it becomes a driving force and ultimately, as we, you'll see as we get to executive buy-in, it becomes a very important topic of buy-in. So at the highest level, we have these major processes I just talked about side by side. So we have uh, a portfolio management set of processes. We have a project management set of processes. And what we've done is we've created these linkages that as we collect ideas, there's some kind of need from the project world that says we need to identify, we need to get ideas, we need to get them submitted. So we've got to, somebody's got to go out and collect these ideas out in project management land. As we build the business case, we're going to be relying on the project management world to give us some sound process for project scoping, because a big part of the business case are the major parts of a project scope. How many people do we need? How long is it going to take? What's the cost going to be? What are the objectives? Why are we doing this project? How do we measure success? What are the deliverables? Okay, so it's, it's really all these questions at the project scoping level that are going to drive the business case that gets built at the portfolio level. As we go in, we have, as, as we go in and we initiate uh, the, the evaluation, rating, and review process, what we see is questions back and forth between project land and portfolio land such that we see adjustments in scope. We see initial requirements changing to more detailed requirements, and really those, those what do I need, this approach idea that says, well, if I'm going to uh, have some way to review, rate, and evaluate, I've got to have, know something about what it is we're going to deliver. Selection and approval goes back to the planning and scheduling. Measuring and response goes back to execution and control. So let's, let's, let's explode each one of these boxes and let's, let's speak to why it is the resource management starts becoming such a critical link between these two major process domains. And the first one we'll use is uh, the connection between the central collection and management of project requests. And then on the project side, the needs, identification, ideation, and submission. And as we look at the, and again, we're, we're using uh, as we go through each of these uh, detailed boxes, what you're, going to, what you're going to see is we're using major process areas. This is not intended to be, you know, a detailed PMI presentation of everything we would do within each of these process areas. It's really to be uh, conceptually what happens within these boxes. And conceptually, when we see the uh, analyzing the business, selecting the drivers, establishing a strategy, the things that say, well, what's important to the portfolio? What are we going to compare? What are we going to say is a good project? How do we define good? On the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, we see the needs, identification, ideation really coming from the processes that project managers and, 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 and the folks supporting the business would use to bring in projects. So not a whole lot of connection between resource management yet, but let's just acknowledge that these two major process domains exist, and they do have, have informational needs upon each other, but typically not a whole lot of resource management information. As we get down to the business case management on the portfolio side, and then look over to the project scoping side where we're answering key questions. As I mentioned, scoping answers questions like how long is it going to take, what's the cost going to be, what kind of resources are going to be involved. And really, on, on the business case side, because I'm going to have a request, I'm going to develop a business case, I'm going to present a business case, because the business case is so highly reliant on the how much, how long, and who question, I see this first major linkage that says, you know, if I want this business case to be reliable, at some point I've got to know what resources are going to be required, number one, 
And really a sub-question underneath is, are they going to be available? Right? Because ultimately, if the business case is presented, there's going to be a question of, as I put all of these projects together, can, I, can, can the unique configuration of resources available to this portfolio actually deliver on that combination of projects? So we see the first time where we're, we're beginning to, to ask that question. As we move into the next process, major process area, we see the connection between the review, rating, and evaluation process against the scope adjustment and initial requirements. And again, what we see is the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, really, you know, the benefit is, is going to be uh, sort of put in the business case, but the cost is really fundamentally driven off of how many resources are going to be involved. Now, I acknowledge that people aren't the only resource available to a project. I mean, clearly there are capital-intensive projects where the people cost becomes less of an issue than the capital costs. But in general, uh, we're really talking about human resource availability. So the assumption here is that the cost-benefit assessment, there's a component of that that relies on saying what are the people requirements going to be. On the right-hand side, the refinement of resource requirements, as we see adjustments in the business cases, what we typically see is um, Maybe, for example, in a portfolio when we're doing the selection process, when we're evaluating what's going to be in and out of the project portfolio, one of the changes we might see is to say uh, that project's not going to make it unless, unless we can do it for less money. So we go back to, the, we go back to uh, the business and we say, your project may make it if we can show less risk, if we can get it done sooner if we can do it in the second half versus the first half of the year. All these kinds of questions ultimately may, may cause some refinement of the resource requirements. So we see this back and forth between these two domains during the review, rating, and evaluation process, because ultimately where we're going with this is to say, well, the projects, some set of projects are going to get selected. And, and a fundamental assumption that the business will make when we're looking at a portfolio of projects a fundamental assumption is if you pick my project and say it's going to get done, it's going to get done. So if it doesn't get done, that's not okay. So here we really see that pressure to say, well, everything we just led up to in terms of bringing in the idea, building the business case, review, rating, and evaluation, ultimately culminating in, you know, once we align it with business objectives, the prioritization selection and elimination of some projects that we've got, to, we've got to start getting to the point where we know who's going to perform the work. Now, we're not always going to get on the project side of the house once we do uh, detailed planning, uh, project planning and scheduling. At the time of selection, at the actual point of approval, we may not know the named resources. But really, this is the turning point where we go from a theoretical planning process to say, if this project has been approved, it's going to get started. And if it's going to get started, it's no longer a theoretical, I've got 100 people of a similar skill set that can perform this work and support this group of projects. Now that my project has been selected, I have to know who, in fact, are the people and the named resources that will commit to this project. So now we see the heat getting turned up a little bit as we, as we turn the corner from really the portfolio planning set of processes and the project planning set of processes to start moving into the actual selection and performance and execution of those projects. So we see the approval of the funding. We see here capturing a baseline for the evaluation of variances to the plan. And really part of that baseline clearly is a baseline resource commitment. What's the total labor that's going to get performed? What are the resource types that are going to perform that labor? In which time periods will that labor occur? And ultimately, that's really the answer of availability versus capacity once we, once we state those basic points of data within the project plans. So now we're at this magic point called measure and respond on the portfolio side and execution and control on the project side. Measure and response has to do with reviewing and auditing what's happening within the projects, reporting and evaluating what's happening in the projects, and escalating and responding with what's happening within those projects. And on, on, the, on the resource side, the tracking, the variances, the reporting of status. Now, there's no red boxes here because, in fact, each one of these we're going to talk about separately. So the connection point between review and audit has to do with, from a governance standpoint, 
are the folks who are, on the, uh, who are in charge of governing the portfolio managers, if you will, going out into the projects once they kick off beyond the selection and approval process and taking some responsibility for getting into the projects and into the review of the actuals and into saying what, in fact, is going on. Are, we, are you, the project management community, tracking progress? So not only do we have a set of measurements that we're going to, res that we're going to evaluate against, but are we, are we collecting the data that we're going to need to be able to take those measurements? Okay, as we take the measurements, we get into this idea of how we report and evaluate. Okay, so once we have the measurements, once we track the actuals, presumably there's a baseline that occurred during the project planning process, meaning a snapshot of the original commitments, that, 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 that business case that was committed to during the selection and approval process on the portfolio side, now results in saying, well, now we know what a variance is because if we have actual progress, where are we at on the map today? If we had the initial plan, what was the red line we drew on the map to say what was the journey going to look like? Now that we've embarked on this journey, are we still on course? Or do we need to make adjustments? So as we get into the escalate and response scenario, we get into these unfavorable variances, or we get into changes in the business plan. We think about what goes into a business plan. One of the things that goes into a business plan, you know, if we ask a, a project manager to find success, a typical answer we'll get is on time, on budget, on spec. And on spec typically is thought of as meeting the design, the specifications. So an example I like to use here is to say, well, you know, if, if I, you know, let's picture that $5 a gallon gas, gasoline, and if I had a project plan that said I'm going to build a vehicle that burns, uh, that gets two miles to a gallon, I could deliver on time, on budget, on spec. Yes, the vehicle gets two miles per gallon, but a question I might ask during the reporting and evaluation and escalation and response process is besides the basic project metrics on time, on budget, on spec, what about those portfolio metrics? Remember, we were aligned with business objectives, and one of the business objectives might have been produce fuel-efficient vehicles, or it might have been produce really big vehicles to consume a lot of gas. Okay, but now we go out into the marketplace and we find out the market has changed. Okay, so as we escalate and respond, from the project status, we may find out that one of the responses is to ask the question, should this project continue? Again, from a resource management standpoint, what we often see is if there are variances on a project, oftentimes the kinds of variances a project manager would track in terms of on time, on budget, the schedule oftentimes falls behind because of the lack of availability of committed resources that were anticipated to be available when the project started. Why does that happen? because we've got a portfolio of projects. If the resources that were supposed to wrap up their last project did not become available for my project, my project is going to start late. And now we start to see this question from senior management saying, well, wait a minute. We committed to a portfolio of projects. How come our projects didn't start? Oh, well, last year's projects are still happening. Well, time out. If last year's projects are still happening, how come we didn't know about that when we planned the portfolio? Well, we didn't think that was going to happen. Well, why didn't we think that was going to happen? Well, the Gantt chart said it wasn't going to happen. Whoops. So now we start to see this, this question of, well, how do we get beyond the Gantt chart? Okay, so the escalation and response process gets to, should we continue? What's our response? Are we really tracking all the projects against the initial, initial portfolio commitments? Because now what we have is a variance at the portfolio level. Projects aren't happening as anticipated. Now what's the ripple effect? What are we going to do about that? Not only that. What about new ideas that came on board? Are we going to go back to the beginning of that process? Are we going to think about maybe going back to saying, well, maybe we should think about at the portfolio level whether or not we want to be able to go back and say, let's collect some new ideas, let's bring in some new business cases, let's, let's review and rate and evaluate against the existing group of projects that we're looking at, and now let's select and approve some new projects. So this should be really a continual process in a well-oiled portfolio and project management world where we have that keystone firmly in place, we ought, we ought to be able to go back here into the escalation of response and say one of the responses is to cancel bad ones and bring in new ones. And maybe we do, do, do that on a more frequent cycle than we were able to before we had this sort of nimbleness in our process. So 
the solution is the integration of project and portfolio processes. Clearly, through these last five slides I just covered, there, there, there is a case to be stated to say, well, we really can't survive at the portfolio level without good information from the project level. And the project level may run out of control without good support from the portfolio level. Why? Well, I just used an example where we delivered on time, on budget, on spec, but it was still the wrong project. So we can't expect our project manager to say it's not necessary to say I'm working on the wrong project. We shouldn't build this new plant to produce new widgets because the widgets aren't relevant. We shouldn't consolidate markets and close our operations in South America because we're better off being in North America because of NAFTA or whatever those business reasons were. That's not the job of the project manager necessarily to do that. Typically, it's not viewed as the project manager's job. Maybe the project manager is responsible for executing a task it says we validate the business case, but we need folks like new product development, marketing, distribution, sales to really give us data to say, are these projects still relevant? So let's talk about the integration. So I mentioned, I, 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 I talked about this term getting beyond the Gantt chart. And the reason I talk about that is we see, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, project management tools and technologies on the marketplace. And the preponderance of those tools are really used to develop Gantt charts. Microsoft Project is a great example of that, where we see this idea of putting in the task, linking the task, getting a visual view of the schedule. But the question is, is it valid? If I put a date in a schedule, how do I know it's valid? And what we find out is a project management tool doesn't really provide what, we, what I would call an optimized plan, meaning we know that the plan will work, until we start to validate whether the resources will be available to perform the test. Are the dates accurate? How do I know the dates accurate? I have a resource labor estimate. I have availability. I dial that into a plan. And ultimately, that plan will tell me when I can commit to the schedule. Quick example. Resource has 80 hours and is 100% available. I'll be done in two weeks. Resource has 80 hours and is only half time available. I'll be done in four weeks. Resource has 80 hours estimate. And they're not done their last project. They're not going to be available until next month. So it's very, very hard to have reliability in these schedules to, to say to the portfolio manager, managers, yeah, we've got a handle. Yeah, the project's going to end. Sure, you can count on those resources being available for this new portfolio we're crafting because of the reliability of the Gantt chart. So what we see at some point is sort of the surrender of the project managers to say, time out, folks. If you want me to give you accurate estimates, we need to surrender and give up this idea that all we need is a Gantt chart. I can't tell you what the resource capacity versus demand is by project until we start to get reliability, until we get beyond the Gantt chart. Okay, so now we start saying, okay, well, once we surrender, now what happens? And what we find is the reason a lot of organizations really can't surrender to getting beyond the Gantt chart is because of a, of, of a really strong emphasis on what I call column two. There's an awful lot of training and technology that happens and an awful lot of process talk that happens that really isn't built on a firm foundation up front of really a strategy and a tactical plan. Treating getting better and linking project and portfolio management is just another project. All right, so if I look at column one, just another project says, I've got to know my current state, my future state, how big the gap is, and how I'm going to close the gap. So focusing on a plan on column one, executing that plan in column two, and implementing stuff like technology, like process, like, uh, like training or people capabilities, ultimately leads to this ability that says, you know, at the project level, I'm sorry, at the portfolio level, doing project management well is really part of the governance process. That if we want to do project management well, the portfolio management world has some responsibility to do that measure and respond thing, right? That says, if you look down in, in, into these bullets here, that when we integrate process technology and training, when we do coaching and mentoring, when we do process adoption and audit, reporting and escalation, intervention and corrective action, and ongoing support of the project management community, that is a set of processes. Yes, project management is a process, but getting good at project management is a different process. So we have the project management processes of on time, on budget, on spec, right? So we can go back there and say, yeah, I've got these processes to say we're going to do on time, on budget, on spec. But at some point, I've got to go over here into the governance processes and say, well, in fact, how am I going to do that? We said we're going to do that well is when we really got into the execution level, 
we drop down into this whole idea, if I could just jump to slide 19 again, that the measure and response to the, what's happening in the projects is the ownership and the responsibility of the world of portfolio management. So again, when I, when I speak to this concept of a best practice of getting beyond the Gantt chart, what we've seen over and over and over again with our customers is until we really embrace a sound three-column best practice, until we surrender to the idea that I can't really get beyond the Gantt chart and get to resource capacity versus demand until I get to a way I can govern and really drive the changes necessary and the rigor necessary that says, you know, it's a pretty different thing to ask my project managers to build a Gantt chart than it is to have them have this continual, not just one time, but remember, we're dealing with this continual need right, to not just set the cards up once, but we see this constantly changing resource demand. And until I enable my project managers to deal with that demand, I'm really not doing the job I need to do. And that job really happens in column three. Okay, so I want to talk about this in just a little bit more detail to really talk about, well, how do we drive the right solution through portfolio management maturity? And really the question is, how do I get an organization from an initial set of processes and standards all the way up to an optimized level of maturity? to where processes are in place to optimize the portfolio management and the performance of the projects. I just use a quick example here. If we look at maturity of resource management, and what, what this is I'm about to show you, it says a sample band from the portfolio and project management maturity model. Um, this is a, a set of definitions we've developed through experience with our customers is saying, you know, if people and organizations want to get better and want to improve and want to execute a plan for improvement, there are logical steps that need to be taken. And we, we see this keystone coming up over and over and over again that says, to link my portfolio and project management, I really have to get better at resource management. So let's look at just a quick example of some of the linkages that occur. And I realize the print is small on the screen, so I apologize. This is not intended to be a slide that you would read, but just a, a concept. So here's the concept. I want to get to a point where I can collect actuals on my projects, I can analyze variances, I can know where the people are, so I can reliably execute my project, respond to those variances, revise my plan, send your statuses up to the portfolio level, and have good decisions be made for the business about which projects we should be working on. So in order to do that, ad hoc or initial says, there's not a formal time estimating technique. Project plans are not status for labor cost or schedule. Projects are not baseline. Fairly typical, unfortunately, in a, in a lack of in, a, in an organization that lacks maturity, to say that we estimate our timelines, but we don't really have a formal technique for doing that. We don't have a good way to, to estimate the tasks. We don't have a methodology that we use consistently in the organization. Uh, we build a project plan, but we never go back and status them for cost or schedule. So we don't really have a baseline. Uh, as we move forward, we may see what we typically see is maybe updating of the schedule, but not the labor or cost. So we change the dates that things get out of whack, but if somebody says, well, what happened? We really can't tell because we're not baselining. Did we get the resources we need? Well, gee, we're not sure because we're not really tracking resources. When we get to a defined level of maturity, we start to see some maybe collection of actuals, oftentimes at the project level. So the project managers will say, well, yeah, we have a time collection system, but I can't see which tasks or which phases are being worked on. So we see a lack of clarity to be able to say to the portfolio managers, well, I can tell you when these resources are going to get released because I know what they've done in my project. And ultimately, to move up to a level, level five, that says historical variance data is utilized across all projects. What's the point here? The point is to say where you stand today as an organization and where you'd like to get to may have a fairly large gap. So that column one example I was using that where we talked about a best practice, really that best practice is initiated and starts at this just to jump back to slide 22 just for a second, this idea of understanding the current state, the future state, how big is the gap, what's the strategy to close it, what's the tactical plan or the project plan to say we're going to get better at resource management, really with a firm definition or a firm understanding of what our current maturity level is, specifically within resource management, how good or bad we are and how far we have to grow so that ultimately we can go drive executive buy-in to make it happen. So the executive buy-in, I'll just talk about this for a couple of minutes here. Um, ultimately, there's a cost of doing nothing, right? And, and I've, I've sort of mentioned this in, you know, in a roundabout way today. I talked about projects being canceled and, 
and how budgets are done on an annual basis and, uh, you know, really how we deal with this. And what we've seen is, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been asked the question many times, what is the return on investment? Can we demonstrate the return on investment from projects? And, and really, one of the challenges we have in demonstrating a return on investment is to say, well, if you're not good at project management, how are you going to measure how bad you're doing? Right? How are you going to manage, manage what the average timeline is to get a project done? Or how are you going to measure what percentage of your projects had accurate resource estimates so we know how much better we've gotten? So what we suggest is to look at some really trouble signs and say, you probably can't do this. For example, an organization that doesn't can projects in a timely manner, that's, in, that's a, a sign that the portal man really isn't getting reliable data from resource management. Because if you had reliable data, it would be more timely and rigorous and more disciplined in how we cancel bad projects. A lot of organizations let pro bad projects go on for a long time. Uh, the other cost of doing nothing is uh, user, to lose, user to budget spend. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of budgets are, are spent out in the fourth quarter. If, you, if we were to track our, our project spend or even our organizational spend, we would see a spike in the last quarter of a fiscal year that says we're on an annual planning cycle. And we're on an annual planning cycle, and at the, end of, at the end of the fiscal year, we spend everything, which means we don't really have a smooth way of tracking our projects to know whether bad ones are coming in and new ones are coming out. Because if that were the case, we'd have a level spend. Uh, reliance on the status quo versus embracing change has a certain implement cultural change. So uh, leaving things alone is typical of what we do. The ability to directly link making and keeping resource commitments to, uh, uh, to the need for the accurate resource data provides a solid foundation for the business case. So that last bullet is really the key. But the ability to linking and making resource commits. Right, so what do we mean by that? Making and keeping resource commitments says when I pick projects, I deliver on them. So, so from the executive buy-in standpoint, typically we see executives begin to buy into we got to get better at project execution because when we ask the question of what happened to those projects I committed to, why didn't we get them done? We say, well, because I didn't know when resources were going to become available. Well, why not? Because the projects weren't finished. Well, why didn't we know? Because the projects had dead charts, basically. We had high-level schedules. We weren't statusing those things. We didn't really know capacity versus demand. And until you tell me from the resource, from the project management community, how those metrics are going. I can make and keep resource commitments. So I need accurate resource data to give you a solid foundation for the business case. The business case says I know how many people I'm going to need. The business case says approve it. I know I can get it done. So the monitoring tech really gets to demonstrating progress to stakeholders. One of the ways we can demonstrate progress to stakeholders is to free up resources for more worthy initiatives. Right, so even though I may not have a direct return on investment, which, by the way, I'll get to in a moment. There are some metrics out there. But, again, just using some qualitative empirical data says that as my project cancellations go up, as I cancel them sooner, I free up resources faster to make them available for projects. Okay, and when I make them available for projects, what I probably have is a pretty good sense and response and a pretty good escalation uh, process in place. And it's a sure sign of health between project and portfolio management. Again, the, the level spend, <clears throat> when we see the spikes in the fourth quarter, uh, we're looking here at a nice level spend where my first quarter spend on projects was about the same as the fourth quarter spend. We'll see that happening as, 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 a, as, a, as a portfolio management organization becomes nimble. And again, that nimbleness oftentimes is predicated on a reliability of the resource capacity versus demand. The effectiveness, how do we measure it? Well, it's probably not surprising that if we have effective uh, resource management projects finish sooner, okay, one of the reasons that happens is because our, our, our resources are available when they were expected to be. Uh, cost of runs are reduced or eliminated. As we, come, as we become more efficient and more on top of things, we have a tendency to spot variances sooner, to deal with the scope changes faster, to take bad projects out of the portfolio sooner, to go get funding or cancel funding. Okay, and ultimately the bottom line is that those ineffective projects are canceled. Uh, why change? 
Um, from the data that has been available on the project efficiency, uh, one of the things I think is, is really telling, this is, this is a, a stat from IDC, and you'll see that the average, uh, from, from a study done, the average cost of a group of projects that was running half a million dollars dropped down to $315,000. So we see something like a 37 percent improvement. There's other data out there that says that improvement is even better. But this is, this is one source of information that says this is doing why? Because my projects are, in fact, going to cost less. The other one that I thought was pretty, pretty interesting was uh, the percentage of projects at uh, an ad hoc level of project management maturity compared to a uh, level four or an optimized level of maturity. So this, you know, why does maturity matter? So, you know, going to, going to an executive team and saying we should do this because um, it's really cool to increase our project management maturity from one to four and we should do that is a lot less meaningful than saying, you know, here's some data that says projects aligned with company goals were pretty much two-thirds uh, versus almost 100% when we got to optimize. Why does that happen? Well, as, as we see that, uh, that, that efficiency in the, in the upfront portfolio processes, as we see the right data about whether we're doing the right projects, we are going to have a tendency to not do projects that don't have good alignment with overall goals in the project. Same thing for failed projects. Now, this is an interesting one, and, and clearly uh, the definition I'm comfortable with for failure is different than what we're talking about here. In this case, that would be uh, major cost overruns, uh, major miss of probably project uh, expectations, and, and in other words, finishing the project and having it delivered wrong. Okay. Another way to look at this is we, we, we uh, I would call that project cancellation. This is actually failure of the project. So the failures go down. I would say, and, uh, and sort of the inverse relationship there, is that the cancellations have gone up. We stop them before they fail. If the bridge is out, we don't let the train get wet, we stop the train. As opposed to changing the project plan to say, now we're going to have wet passengers. Uh, projects over budget, uh, again, another sort of definition of failure typically, is uh, we see a third dropping down to uh, almost uh, one in eight. Project redos, 25% uh, dropping down to two. So you get the point. It's worth doing. So avoiding failures and recommended best practices. Um, I really talked a little bit about best practices already, and I'm really going to talk about uh, really, a, you know, unfortunately a common failure. And what we see is what I call a talk spend talk mentality. Okay, so a strategy that says we're going to, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time on column two. And as you may recall, when I talked about column two, I was really talking about this uh, this initial best practice that we had spoken of back on twenty two. Okay. Right. Column one is an assessment strategy and tactical plan. Uh, column two is deploying a technology training process. And column three is putting in that adoption, that execution and governance, uh, governance of execution. Okay, so really what we're talking about here from a failed strategy is really an overemphasis on buying technology, buying training. And then on the first one and three, well, we, and we've seen this over and over again, yeah, we got it. We're cool with that. Yeah, we've got a strategy. Yeah, we, we pretty much know where we are. We're at zero. And we want to be a five, and we know what that takes. So really, when I talk about talk, I really mean that not that people rec don't recognize, or organizations don't recognize, that having a, an understanding of current future state, how big the gap is, what the plan is to close it, not that people don't recognize that that's not important, but really that the, the organizations talk to that, instead of really having a really sense of formality. Same thing on the back of war talk. Right, we implement the technology, we implement the training, and then we talk about how great things are going to be, as opposed to really formally going back and building those governance processes for coaching and mentoring, adoption and audit, reporting and escalation, intervention and corrective action. It says corrective action means I'm going to cancel your project. We have a very specific set of metrics to say when that's going to happen, as opposed to saying, yeah, at some mythical point in the future, we're going to do more, better, faster, cheaper. So just talk about the next steps for a moment here before I turn this over to questions and answers. Uh, just a moment about, uh, about you know, it might not surprise you to know that what Project Assistance does for a living is actually make the world a better place for portfolio and project management. We transform our clients' approach to portfolio and project management and really help with excellence and execution. So uh, these initiatives, uh, I talk about executive buy-in. Why? Because people are afraid to do them. They're risky. 
right? So, so our approach helps reduce risk. Uh, there's a question of is this unnecessary overhead, especially in today's economy? Is this something we can really do without uh, without having to cost us money and not getting a benefit? So we really have to show that there's a demonstrated return on investment. Uh, and by the way, it has to happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, we can improve, improve portfolio and project management, but a three to five year planning horizon is not acceptable in today's world. So maximizing the speed of uh, realizing business value is very important. And effective organizational change, really column three that's about. Right, so we really drive the adoption and the governance by saying we don't just spend in column two, but we in fact have a best practice. Okay, so we have a number of practices. The first couple of practices I'm putting up here are really about delivering solutions. So we deliver strategies, we deliver technology implementations, uh, training uh, solutions, uh, collaboration, including SharePoint, uh, application development, and really the next two boxes, the outsourcing and the staffing. We also staff projects. So we supply project managers as well and, and portfolio uh, management folks, and uh, also uh, specific solutions for project management uh, software. So from the next standpoint, before I open the floor for questions, uh, I'd like to uh, offer a complimentary uh, maturity assessment and a readiness briefing. So if your organization is interested in talking about how we do columns one and three better, certainly uh, you know, we, we, we tend to focus on specific areas where there's a lot of pain, uh, the reporting, the technology environment, the resource planning methods, the overall governance. Uh, looking at the overall, uh, we have a methodology for looking at your capabilities and, and uh, looking at the future state. I did show you an example of that uh, in the project management maturity band. Uh, how to develop a roadmap. Uh, whether you have one, how we can scope and, and justify uh, within a roadmap to, to, to get investment in these areas. And again, the, the, the typical challenges, right? The, the ill-conceived technology deployments and really the damage that does to an organization and the jaded uh, feelings and we can't afford to invest in this anymore, the last one failed. Uh, the common training competency development shortcomings. So I mentioned a lot of training, but maybe not a lot of mentoring and coaching and integ integration with technology and process and really finding the, uh, the appropriate project management methodology and the guidance to get there. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jan in a moment, uh, but uh, Jan's contact information is here. Certainly uh, you're welcome to contact me through Jan as well. So you see the phone number, both toll-free and direct, uh, Jan's email address and also our website. Also, we'll be, we, we've been doing uh, every other month we do these webinars. Uh, so the previous webinars can be found on our website and upcoming uh, webinars which uh, will be announced for 2010 uh, uh, in a matter of a couple of days or certainly a couple of weeks. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance. I'd like to invite you uh, uh, to use your so, so Jan, I'm going to turn it back to you for a moment if I can. Sure, Beth, we've already received a few questions, so I'm going to just jump right into that right now. Um, I'll read the first question to you. How do you suggest managing resources in those functions like operations that have a large non-new project resource drain? Pushback from function is too burdensome to track actual, actuals on functional projects that may overrun and steal from new product development representation on core teams. That's a good question and a common question. And um, I, I'll use some examples uh, to answer your question. Uh, thanks for the question. I appreciate that. Uh, the, the, que the question, the answer that we typically suggest is there's a variety of ways to do that. And yes, I would agree that, that it's hard uh, to get down to the details that are happening in functional projects to say we're going to track actuals not only within the projects we're responsible in our portfolio, but also in those business projects uh, that may not be within the scope of the portfolio. So a, a typical starting point, and I'm going to start with some of the less accurate, but unfortunately from a maturity standpoint, uh, more necessary ways to start. So, so a, a very common way is to use percentages. We're going to assume that 35% of our resources aren't available to support projects. Unfortunately, in the real world, there's something like 70 to 85%. But to use some kind of a, a percentage that says, now on the project side of the house, as I build my capacity or my availability uh, algorithms or, 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 or calculations or spreadsheets or if you're doing it in a project management tool, I can do that by using a percentage. Uh, a more reliable way is to, uh, uh, and the project management tools will allow this to block calendars. So, uh, you know, a human resources capacity essentially is a reflection of their calendar. So we see where calendaring uh, technology is used, 
um, Outlook. Uh, in Microsoft Project, you can actually use a, a resource calendar for each resource on the project. Uh, ultimately, the most accurate way to get to it is to get down to that nitty-gritty level that you, you know, you even acknowledge in your question, pushback from function is too burdensome to track action, actual. So uh, while it would be theoretically nice to get the actual availability of resources from the projects that are not within the portfolio, reality dictates that that's not going to happen. So let me, let me summarize the answer to the question so we can move on to another question. Um, the easier methods have less reliability, right? If I use a percentage, unfortunately, that percentage may be true over a one-month, three-month, six-month, or one-year scenario, but within the week or the days in which the real projects are happening, those generic percentages tend to be off because while you may be 30% available to my project overall, that 30% may not occur until next summer. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the, really there's a cost-benefit scenario that says the more rigor I place into this resource tracking, the more reliability I'm going to get in telling me whether folks, in fact, are or are not available. So uh, when, we use, when we build these tactical plans based on current state, future state of maturity, typically these kinds of scenarios of the, you know, the, the, I'll say the lack of maturity of the current state drive the necessary next step to say how much effort we really can make realistically to improve the maturity of the, of the organization such that over time we get better. What's the trade-off? The less, the less mature the organization is, the less reliable the answers are going to come from the systems we build that lack that maturity. So I hope that was a helpful answer to your question. And certainly uh, feel free to email us if, uh, if you want. Uh, we can schedule some follow-up time if you want to answer those questions. Do we have any more questions, Jen? Um, we do, Gus. Are you seeing a trend of companies making project and portfolio management integration investments that really get beyond the Gantt chart and produce real ROI? Oh, uh, yeah, we are. And, and you know, the, again, we've never seen a meaningful investment. And I didn't say this in, in the webinar, so thanks for the question and, and the request for a clarification. We haven't seen situations where portfolio and project management get linked, A, without the need to do that at the resource management level. And I should, I should clarify that. I should say in a meaningful way. Clearly, you know, lists of projects come in and, 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 and portfolios get approved and, and projects, you know, kick off and there's an assumption that they're going to happen. But to really have those meaningful investments in the linkage between resource and port and, uh, I'm sorry, to meaningful link resource management to project management and portfolio management, uh, we have seen where the executive support required to drive any of these changes, to do anything in column one and column three, and to get the investment required in column two, really has to be that demonstration and that belief from, from uh, executive management to say, we understand that we can't get beyond the Gantt chart until we make an investment in getting beyond the Gantt chart. I think we might have time for one more, Jen. Gus, what's the biggest barrier you see that prevents people from taking on these challenges? Well, I, I guess, you know, to, to go back to what's probably, a, 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 uh, admittedly and maybe somewhat apologetically our most sarcastic slide for the day, you know, um, we view this talk, spend, talk as a, as a real barrier because um, we have not seen, I think I can safely say in the, in the, in the 16 years and I, I go back to the pre-project assistance times um, prior to our merger in 96. You know, the 16 years we've been doing this, um, first of all, we've seen less than 50% success in connecting uh, portfolio and project management, or I'll say getting behind the Gantt chart, uh, which is really laying the foundation for connecting these two. Less than 50% success. In those that have been successful, I can safely say in 100% of the cases, there's never been a case where column two worked without one and three being a meaningful part, that there really was no, not a talk about uh, a current state, future state tactical plan, but a real plan that was solid, that was viewable, that was brought out to the organization, that was a multi-phase plan for how we're going to do the spending in column two. Then ultimately, once we did the spending, that there really was uh, a reliable uh, audit review process, uh, a reporting escalation process that says the projects aren't going well, uh, who are we going to report them to, to the steering committees, and then ultimately to the actions. Um, that were stipulated by the steering committees to actually uh, cancel projects, bring new ones in, uh, uh, get funding for projects that maybe need more money, all that business. So 
the strategy of Hope to take care of columns one and three, to talk, talk, talk. I've uh, never seen it work. Never seen it work once. So we are bumping up. Near as I can tell, we've got about uh, 10 seconds before 4 o'clock on the button here. So um, any more questions, Jim? That's all we have. Okay, thanks, everybody. I appreciate your uh, attendance today and uh, welcome you to, to, to future webinars. Uh, please visit our website. And again, if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to us directly. Thank you all for your time today.